We're going to get started this morning with what looks to be a very exciting talk with a couple uh, couple, couple recorded demos because these guys are smart and they don't do live demos at DEF CON. That is, that's, not allowed to. Well, you're allowed, but it's just a really, really terrible idea. <laughs> um, so if, you, if this is your first time in track four, which we are calling Fancy Track, here in Fancy Track you cannot vape, you cannot smoke anything of any kind. Uh, you are not supposed to be having any kind of outside beverages other than water. There you go. Um, like I said, if you want to kind of move towards the center so that people can get in and out, that will help because we're going to have a lot of people come into a lot of really good talks today. With that said, let's get Topher and Michael up here. Um, how many people use antivirus at work? How many people believe it does anything? There we go. How many people use EDR at work? Yeah? How many people believe it does something? Aha! <laughs> Suckers! <laughs> Let's give Michael and Topher a big round of applause. Have a good time, John. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming uh, on an early uh, Saturday morning. This is uh, EDR is coming, hide your shit. Um, I'm really happy to uh, be here this year. This sort of uh, came about as a hallway conversation at DEF CON last year. We had some ideas, we talked it over, it turned into some research and uh, here we are and that's pretty exciting. So go out there and talk to all the people and have all the ideas and submit something next year. All right, so um, who are we? Well, first of all, we, we don't speak for our employer. These are, these are speaking all on behalf of ourselves and nothing that we're saying is to be construed as, you know, from our employer. I, I, I'm Michael Leibowitz. I like to, uh, on my, in my free time, write uh, or make hardware implants, re-implementing NSA uh, hardware implants and uh, I'm a principal troublemaker. And? And uh, I'm Topher Timson. I like doing like C sharp malware stuff. So hilariously enough, some of the things you're going to see in this talk I've talked about uh, previously at DevCon 23. So it's kind of like the old is still new. Uh, I'm a principal vulnerability enthusiast. We both work on red teams, and as you can see by our matching attire, we uh, we just want to drink coffee and write malware. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Uh, here's what we're going to go through and we have a, a lot to cover so we're going to go through it pretty fast but basically what EDR is, why we care. Uh, UEFI and the thing to note about UEFI is UEFI is cross platform which is why we're doing a, a Windows and a Linux demo and why we have a Windows and Linux payload. Of course, you know, what everyone's wondering, what does this all mean? And then, you know, some mitigation or whatever and then future work and then conclusions. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to kind of start off with talking about EDR. So a lot of you raised your hands that you use this and, and think it works. So we're about to, you know, kind of ruin that for you. Um, so kind of, uh, so it's 10 o'clock. The slides are a little bit hungover. So uh, EDR is endpoint detection and response, not enterprise. Uh, thanks slides for being up early with us. Um, the biggest thing about EDR is that it's really just defensive tooling that focuses on like detecting, investigating, and mitigating suspicious activities going on within an environment. The big thing that it really provides blue teams is a hunt capability. So this is how in a lot of uh, organizations they're making like lar large scale like correlations for hunt stages. So like oh this machine over here is doing these sorts of things that's not really typical. This alert fired in our seam. Let's go investigate. Um, typically it really just means that like for us on red teams that blue team's going to find you and we don't want to be found. Uh, so we're going <laughs> to sort of look at how we avoid that. Um, and then like the one big thing with EDR is that typically everything's mapped to uh, like MITRE ATT&CK and if you're not familiar with MITRE ATT&CK that's essentially just like this huge knowledge, knowledge base of, uh, of things that attackers tend to do based off of real world observation. So like you probably hear the term like TTPs thrown around everywhere. Um, in essence it's really just this huge table that lists things that attackers like to do. So you kind of like think back to previous life when you were in kindergarten and you get like a gold star for like turning in your homework on time and like being polite. It's essentially like that but for like us as bad guys. So we get gold stars when we do like persistence. We get a gold star for privilege escalation. <laughs> uh, so like we want to fill out all the things but not have anybody know so we don't actually get the gold stars. Uh, we just want to do it. Um, so like 
I'm saying like EDR is really just tuned re like in actuality for like processes, commands, and API calls. So if you're like running say like uh, cmd.exe or PowerShell or doing like some registry stuff or trying to set up persistence, because those are like TTPs in the MITRE attack framework, those tend to be flagged and mapped and then alerted on for the, the blue team um, and we want to make sure that none of that actually happens. So uh, a lot of people talk about you know the risk curve and um, you know this is the other side of the risk curve. Basically, you know no no attack no breach lasts forever, right? You can see from the right side of the graph that eventually you're going to get busted, and you, you you land your shell. You know that's kind of the highest risk time. You move around a little bit, and eventually you sort of settle into persistence. And like the longer you hold on, the more chance it is that someone's going to roll you up. And really. What we want to do is, you know, make this curve flatten a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, what what does it mean when, you know, the breach gets detected? Like, no one's sleeping well tonight. This is this is terrible. You know, your lovingly crafted payload becomes the analyst sample. You're like very upset because all these months of work and crafting that <laughs> super awesome payload are just down the drain and the analyst is like Oh shit, there goes my Friday night. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody's happy. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to modify this risk curve. We want to make it such that, you know, you're, we're not going to flatten that initial shell pop kind of, kind of part. Like that's kind of the same, but we just want to, we just want to hang on to the good stuff for longer. Eventually we're, eventually you're going to get rolled up, but we just, just hang out and chill out for a little bit longer. <laughs> So as we were investigating ways that we can hide from a UEF or from a EDR, Mike and I had some pre-existing platform experience, a particular UEFI platform experience, so like platform firmware. Um, so in sort of this research it's like uh, we were thinking that we can utilize this sort of functionality to evade all of these detections and make that risk curve uh, and the dwell time for us last a little bit longer. Um, so if you're not familiar with UEFI, uh, I have to include this awesome diagram of it because John Lucades told everybody ever talking about UEFI that they have to. Um, essentially, if you're not familiar with UEFI, it's essentially what modern BIOS is now. So it does all of the things that you don't really are, uh, care about like CPU in it, trains your memory, it loads a bunch of option ROMs from like your PCI devices. Uh, there's other talks that go over what this actually means, uh, but what we're concerned about is if you look at the bottom, there's this notion of runtime services, and after the OS boots, those are exposed at the operating system level. Some of the things that get exposed within the runtime services stage of UEFI are uh, UEFI firmware variables. So these are persistent variables that actually live within your NVRAM on your on on your platform. Uh, that are accessible both to UEFI applications like if you're familiar with secure boot, all of your secure boot like variables and stuff live there. So like boot order, like your uh, the keys that secure boot utilizes, things of that uh, nature. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that we can persist within NVRAM within the UEFI platform that we can then access at operating system runtime. Um, so sort of like you're probably thinking at this point, well why UEFI firmware variables? Well like I was saying it, it's a way that you can hide your payloads from all of these detective capabilities because it's, it's a blind spot for all of them. Nobody looks here like really at all especially within AV and EDR platforms. Um, if you're not familiar really with what UEFI firmware variables are either, it essentially consists of like a name and a GUID so it's like this tuple and if you are able to set or get that, uh, that tuple you can pull the contents of what that variable is out of NVRAM and we're going to kind of showcase that we can execute those live on the system to both stash our stuff and to sort of have like this persistence uh, mechanism. So really quickly, uh, like UEFI firmware variables have a couple of types. There's authenticated and unauthenticated. This isn't so much important but we kind of just wanted to briefly touch on it uh, just in case you're concerned at all with the specification or what we're doing. Like um, if you've heard of like authenticated variables, these are signed like X509 certs that uh, perform like a certificate check when writing. 
Uh, we're not going to worry about those. There are unauthenticated variables that are also um, present uh, at that runtime stage. These have no verification on write. The majority of variables on a platform, as we'll show you in a demo, are unauthenticated. Uh, so it's not really abnormal for these to be there, and it's not atypical for things to necessarily be writing or reading from there. Um, if you're like a platform researcher or something, you know about this. Uh, there's a couple of attributes as well to UEFI firmware variables uh, within the specification. We're going to really just focus on three out of the six because as I'll showcase in the Windows 10 API, uh, you have to have non-volatile boot service access and runtime access in order to have uh, UEFI variables that persist within the Windows runtime after boot on your NVRAM. Um, so just note that those three are going to be utilized and that'll be shown in the demo as well. Sort of the hilarious little thing here too with uh, why we sort of started thinking about UEFI as a, as a way to hide from EDR is uh, in, a, in an old, old life we're walking, you know, with some blue team uh, folks and we're talking about ways that we've been being tricky on engagements and sharing some techniques and we're kind of talking about like uh, IOT devices and how it would be cool to hide like an IOT firmware and they're like yeah that'd be cool but like please don't ever hide like in platform firmware and you know Mike and I kind of stopped and we're like oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're going to do Windows and Linux like Mike said uh, UEFI is platform agnostic so it doesn't matter what it's running on. It's, it's part of your platform. It helps boot Intel like processors. It also works like on AMD. Uh, it's kind of different there. It's it's a specification, whatever. Um, so UEFI on Windows. Basically, um, I was re-looking at the MSDN articles for Windows 10 and I recognized, so they had taken this off and then they reintroduced the ability to do UEFI platform stuff within 1803. Um, so I was kind of like reading the documents. They they listed all of these requirements for actually being able to use this a, these API function this API functionality within Windows now. So it was kind of concerning because there there's a lot there that they say you need this otherwise it won't work. Such as you need to declare firmware read and write in your application manifest. You need to have it be a protected app. So like a signed app that the Microsoft Store signs it needs to be signed. You need to be an admin that has access to the special privilege SE system environment name. Uh, like privilege token in your process space. So looking at it, it was kind of daunting because it's it's such a long list of requirements. But you know we're hackers. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, so we started looking at ways to bypass this. Like Spectre Ops puts out a lot of like WDAC bypasses, which is a way to execute signed Windows binaries with that. Well, unsigned Windows binaries. So like unsigned Windows binaries, you can still execute. Um, obviously, on red teams, we sometimes jump to conclusions or we make uh, some leaps forward to speed up engagement time with like assume breach type um, scenarios or sort of the methodology and thinking that we're going to wind up being admin, why don't we just become admin now. Um, so like that sort of stuff for our purposes of doing this sort of thing on red team engagements wasn't necessarily impactful. So we just kind of went with it with the assumption that we're going to be, we can be an admin on a box and we're not going to need it to be assigned a Windows application. So like uh, just to showcase what the read and write firmware variable API looks like from the MSDN articles, you can do set and get firmware variables from NVRAM. Uh, really the key thing here is you just have like the name and GUID tuple that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and for set all you do is you point uh, in the buffer you want to write into the variable, you give it the size and the attributes that you want to have it be declared as and it just sets it in NVRAM for you. And then forget it's the same sort of idea. You give it a name and a GUID tuple, and then you give it the buffer you want to read into, and then it reads the NVRAM out into some memory buffer that you control as the attacker. And of course, you'll wind up executing that once you get the variable out of NVRAM. Uh, these are the attributes, not really important. It's on the slide more for reference, but this is from the MSCD DN article. Note that for variable uh, attribute runtime services, it says if you want this to be accessible during RT, it needs to also be accessible to boot services. So that's kind of why we're going to have to set all three in Windows. So NVBS and RT variables. So when I was initially implementing this, uh, it was sort of the decision between if I wanted it to be in C or in C. -sharp. So I initially implemented all of this in C++ just because it was, 
it was easy because the MSDN articles basically just give you the code you need. But as I was kind of doing the research, it occurred to me that C++ wasn't a viable option because AV flags it very easily. Um, like one thing that you have to do, obviously, if we're getting a firmware variable, is you need RWX memory. So doing a lot of calls to like virtual alloc, virtual protect, uh, is kind of a red flag right now, especially for EDR products as they start querying all these APIs. Um, like most applications aren't like making an RWX memory buffer and then executing it like it was shell code. So we're not going to do that. Um, C sharp can basically do everything C++ can either with P invoke or reflection and having C sharp malware experience in the past was like yeah let's just do it in C sharp. Furthermore most of the C sharp bypasses or some of the most of the WDAC bypasses are in C sharp anyway so that kind of like checked that flag off for us. And then in order to make things kind of easier for all of our red team friends to use particularly on Windows environments we wanted to make sure that they could that they could use it and C sharp is like kind of the direction that uh malware authors in Windows are kind of going for red team engagements these days or or Golang. Um but there's reference code for both in the repo which we'll showcase later after the talk. So essentially the steps for writing a UEFI variable in Windows is really easy once you have that admin privilege. Uh, you essentially just need to obtain the SE system environment name with set priv. Uh, this is the only case of like P invoke that we're going to be using. Um, furthermore like I was saying like in the manifest where you needed read and write capabilities, the MSDN article is weird in that it lists all of those things for C++ applications. It makes no notion of ever doing this stuff in C sharp. So I've never had to declare those things and I don't really know what Microsoft is stating in that. So just ignore that completely. You don't need it for C sharp. Uh, you can then get the address of your pin buffer so that's our payload and then we just write the UEFI variable to NVRAM and now it's persistent storage. So here's some code really quickly to set the privilege. Um, it's just P invokes, so you get processed, you say that you want the new, the new token privilege, you set it, boom, we're good. Then you can get the address of your uh, pin buffer in C sharp, like I said this was your payload. So you initialize an in pointer, you call uh, interop services to get a pinned array of your, of your buffer that you want to write. You pin it so the garbage collector and nothing can, can touch it as you're working with it. And then you just simply write that UEFI variable with the set firmware variable call with uh, the tuple and in this case it's going to be C sharp UEFI and then I have a super secret, uh, super secret quid, uh, super secret quid, say that five times fast, um, that you can Google and figure out what it is. Uh, so the steps for executing UEFI variable are pretty much similar. You still need that token. And the first thing I did in C sharp was I did P invoke with virtual alloc to obtain an RWX memory pointer that I can execute. And then I was just obtaining that UEFI variable back into that buffer so I can execute it. Uh, so the first step, same idea, you need that privilege. The second step is I start P invoking some memory so I have RWX. Oh, uh, but you can't actually really do that in C sharp because it's abnormal to bring things into your import address table that aren't actually C sharp specific. Um, so like all of the virtual calls are more suspicious than getting a new process token because uh, within like C sharp there's no real way to do like process token stuff. You have to pretty much P invoke so it's not sus suspicious. It is suspicious for EDR products that you're <laughs> doing virtual alloc, virtual free and virtual protect within C sharp. It's like whoa, stop right there. We're going to tell the blue team about this and they're going to hunt you down. So we can't do that. Hilariously enough as we were going through this research, um, OJ is working on like a, a C sharp C alarm interpreter and he was dealing with some stuff and he also says the same thing like don't P invoke your .NET apps. Like EDR is going to find you. Like as he says it's the proverbial solution for them hunting you down. Uh, so we are, we're not going to have, we, we're going to lose the ability to P invoke to get RWX memory. Uh, which is kind of a problem. So we can't do step two anymore. But fear not, uh, the CLR and C sharp is fantastic for malware so we're going to actually just now instead of doing any virtual calls, we're going to use reflection within C sharp to obtain RWX JIT memory which just in time compilation leaves RWX memory pages if you're not familiar with it. To read the UEFI variable into that, then we're going to write the UEFI variable into a method table pointer and then we're going to execute the method as if nothing actually ever happened. Uh, so th those are the steps. I'm going to actually go through that in detail because that was probably a little bit jarring. Basically in C sharp if you're not familiar with it, 
because it's an intermediate level uh, language representation of code, it has to get just in time compiled to assembly code before it gets executed by the processor. So within C sharp there's this huge method table that contains all of the methods that the C sharp application knows about and all of those contain a JIT stub for those classes methods. So essentially what that means is at the time of just in time compilation the method table gets referenced, you then get a function pointer to the executable assembly code that the processor will run which is RWX due to the notion of JIT. You can grab that method pointer, dereference the function pointer that the assembly code lives to which is uh, just a location of the method that you're clobbering and overwrite it. So this essentially means we can declare a method that we don't care about, force it to just in time compile, get the pointer to it and then overwrite it. Uh, so it's basically like ret to libc but in C sharp and it's like more fucky. So the steps for that look like this. We're essentially going to now obtain an RWX chip memory page to read the variable into. That's going to consist of defining a method uh, to overwrite, jitting the method, obtaining the pointer to the method and then overwriting it and calling it. So we'll define a method to overwrite. This is in the code that I'm going to be releasing. It's just called overwrite me. It does nothing. We'll jit the method. So here you can see in reflection I'm doing a type of the program I'm in, get method overwrite me. I call compile service runtime helpers prepare method which is essentially just going to jit that with the method handle. So I have my method dot method handle that's dereferencing one of the pointers. And then I obtain the pointer to the method which is just get function pointer once I've jitted it. So now I have the location of the raw assembly code after jit and that RWX memory location. So now I write the UEFI variable payload that's stored in NVRAM into the pointer to method. So I just call get firmware variable EX. Uh, you can see the third argument there after the tuple is pointer to method with then in the fourth argument being buffer length. That's going to take the NVRAM out, plop it in and then I can just execute the method called overwrite me as if it was actual C sharp code and I hadn't done anything malice. So we're going to do a quick demo of what that looks like uh, to kind of tie it all together in Windows. Um, step one, you obtain your, you obtain your shell on target. Uh, we've already done that, so step one's kind of skipped. We're then gonna run write UEFI C sharp. You'll see this with a with a writer binary that I've written. Uh, in an actual like red team engagement or in a campaign, you'd probably do this with like whatever C2 framework you were using. So you can use the C sharp code, say like in Cobalt Strike, with some of the functionality there, and do it on Windows boxes. Um, you'll then do some sort of persistence mechanism for the reader binary which is going to go through and do the steps I just demonstrated with reflection. Um, it's like a four kilobyte binary you'll use for persistence. You can, you know, we're not giving you a persistence mechanism. I'm sure all of you have lots in your bag. Uh, you just need to throw this binary somewhere and, and run it. And then we'll, uh, we'll run it to showcase what it looks like. So the Windows demo is this one. Computers are hard. Computers are hard. So here I am on Windows. Um, I'm going to first go through and run a really quick chipsec module. Uh, if you're not familiar with chipsec, it's a UEFI platform security tool that helps security researchers analyze platform firmware. Uh, it does a lot of cool things for UEFI, particularly variables. So what I did here is I just ran a module to dump and list what all the UEFI variables currently on my system are. You can see that there's a lot of them. Do note that most of these are NVBS plus RT. Uh, so most of them are accessible uh, at runtime services to the operating system and they're of course because they're persistent, they're persistent and NVRAM. So there they are, you didn't see mine. Here I'm going to dump really quickly the variable list to show you that there's contents of all of these variables. Like this one is kind of funny, like test zero, this is a test. Um, so there's lots of variables here. Nobody really ever audits them. Like I said, AV and EDR doesn't look here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run write UEFI or UEFI write C sharp. That's going to write a UEFI variable to NVRAM. I ran chipsec again to show you that it's now there. There it is, uh, C sharp dash UEFI. So now that that's there on box, I can execute what the payload is. Um, but first, I'm going to show you what that uh, there's actual like uh, shell code there. So I'll go into the UEFI variables directory with chipsec. I'll dump it out, and there you can see that I have some shell code there that I'm going to execute out of NVRAM with a with a the the reader binary. Uh, that payload for demo purposes is going to be our our favorite demo, uh, Metasploit. So it's just a meterpreter shell that I'm going to spin up. 
I'm going to go through, run UEFI read C sharp, and then as you can see from that, uh, I successfully just executed a payload at a NVRAM with like a 4 kilobyte binary using reflection. Thank you. So the fun doesn't actually end there. So because this is a persistence mechanism and it's persistent uh, in NVRAM, this means it's going to survive reboots, it's going to survive reinstalling your operating system. The only way to clear this out is to like clobber over that variable or uh, pull NVRAM with like a dediprog and re uh, like rewrite your UEFI um, variable space. So I'm going to shut down the box, reboot it, go back to my Metasploit shell, uh, rerun the console, and then it's a cooking show, it takes a long time for Windows to boot so speed it up, uh, you know, I just put the payload in the oven, it's going to be done pretty quickly, the machine's booting, still booting, it's a cooking show, wait a minute, there it is, let's see, and there we go, I just executed my payload out of NVRAM again uh, with a persistence mechanism out of a UEFI variable. Ooh, ooh, fresh cookies. Yay cookies. And shells. It, it, uh, I baked some shells. Awesome. Um, so we kind of like have hand waved the persistence thing. We're going to leave that as an exercise up to the reader. Like I said, WDAC bypasses are a great way to do this. Uh, in actuality, uh, your payload's a UEFI variable. Like, good luck, have fun, analysts. Uh, we love you still though. Like, we're going to help you, but this is fun. Um, so like what about Windows EDR products? We haven't necessarily touched on that. Like obviously this is a way to, to mitigate detection. Um, so we looked at a couple of uh, EDR vendors and we found no relevant information pertaining to the usage of either of these API calls, executing at a UEFI variable or anything of that nature. The only thing they're really going to see is that you're executing this binary. Uh, but like there's binaries executed on systems all the time. That's not really something too, rele too relevant that's going to trigger hunt. Um, furthermore, uh, there's a lot of ways currently to sinkhole or to tamper with EDR products. So here's like a five line PowerShell script that you can use to like sinkhole EDR products. This works on a lot of them. Uh, like EDR products are s things of software running on a box. Software have configs. Configs can be tampered with. So just tamper with configs a lot of the times and you can get away with anything on a box on Windows. Um, there's a lot of other ways to go about it. We can chat like after the talk about it. Uh, this isn't really a talk about this, so it's a talk about hiding your shit, and that's how you hide your shit in Windows. Um, some WDAC bypasses just for references. Uh, now that I've talked about hiding your shit in, in Windows, uh, Mike's going to talk about some Linux stuff. Boy, Windows is silly. <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 talk about Linux. Linux is you know everyone knows that's where the real loot is. So. Let's talk about the problem space. Uh, basically, let's introduce our players here. We have, you know, the kernel, we have the EDR, and we have on the right we have your sample. And, you know, the EDR is looking at your sample and that's, that's bad. That's what makes it your sample and not your payload. <laughs> um, and, you know, the EDR and your sample are actually kind of peers, right? We're both running as privileged processes and the EDR has some hooks into kernel space to help it do help it do its job and so you, that's what that sort of rectangle just above the eyeballs is. Eyeballs are obviously EDR. <laughs> <laughs> and so like what does our solution space look like? Well, you know, what we really want is just to make, you know, just to sucker punch the EDR a little bit, you know, while it's not looking and make sure that it just doesn't look at us at all and then, then it's back to being our payload. So, you know, how are we going to do that? We, we need to like, we need to show up early to the fight, right? So that it never sees us coming. So we need to infect something. So, you know, how does your computer, how does your computer boot? And what can we infect? Well, the first thing that boots is the platform firmware. And that's signed by the OEM. You can't really infect that easily. Boo. The next thing, that's signed by Microsoft, the shim, that's signed by Microsoft and it pivots the key over to the distro. That's a little bit harder to infect. Uh, grub, you know, signed by the distro, no good. The kernel, signed by the distro, no good. But the RAM disk is generated on system and not signed. This sounds like a good time. And then sometime later, some shit happens and the EDR is, is started. So obviously what we need to infect is the RAM disk. So how are we going to, 
what capabilities do we have? What, 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 what tools do we have at our disposal in the Linux environment to, to make things happen and, and, and make the EDR not look at us? So, uh, the first sort of uh, wonderful syscall to uh, introduce is ptrace, right? And this is, you know, why we say the 90s are back again. Like, ptrace uh, exploitation of processes has been like uh, as, as old as time itself, but, you know, in, in it's, it's tapered off in the, in the modern era because we have policies that prevent you from doing it. We have like Yama and SE Linux and App Armor and silly stuff like Smack and Tomoyo and whatever. But the best part about all this stuff is the policy is implied in, is applied in user space. All righty. <laughs> so let's 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 go through this. Um, let's go through this in flowchart sort of land. So we have um, the RAM disk is actually the original PID one. That's actually where uh, init starts from. And then it finds your file system, you know, draw some pretty stuff on screen, like make sure you have the right fonts, whatever. And then it does, it actually deletes everything out of the, out of the root file system except for the target directory and then it moves the mount from the target to root and then it execs systemd. And that will come up again, this sort of deleting everything and then like system D starts and like you know the thumbs down is the policy being loaded that prevents you from attacking the EDR and then of course our eyeballs here are the EDR. So let's, let's talk about some other things. We have FA notify. FA notify is kind of a obscure API but like it's designed for AV. I don't think any AV actually uses it but you know who cares. It, it, exploiting secu or using security APIs for unintended things is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> So basically what this lets you do is this lets you, um, you know, do the AV thing, right? Like uh, a file is accessed, you get to stop that process from accessing that file, decide whether it's okay, and then you can say if it is to go ahead, which is effectively allows us to inhibit startup of other processes. <laughs> uh, another fantastic utility is uh, memfd create. Um, this has been talked about a lot. In, 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 the ha in the hacker scene but essentially like you can create a, an anonymous file and uh, this f works like a file, get a file descriptor uh, and then you can actually access it through you know proc pid fd uh, even from other processes. This is fantastic. Uh, and you know the best part is like everyone says never touch disk kids. <laughs> Uh, and then another API that we can use is, and this is also somewhat obscure and not really security relevant, is um, a PRCTL, PRC timer select. So we need some marker for our process uh, to say to the EDR, don't look at this. And so we need something that's inheritable, right? So, you know, you can, you can have your malicious shell, you can catch shadow and when cat does, Cat also inherits the marker. So um, we do the set timer slack. This basically uh, controls how often you wake up the CPU. It's designed to save power, but I don't care about that. <laughs> and then lastly, like config EFI virus. This is the kernel config to make the EFI virus file system. You saw what a pain in the ass it was to do stuff with UEFI and Windows. Windows is dumb. It's just a file system. You just read and write files. It's super easy. You can do it from a shell script. <laughs> <laughs> And then I talked previously about MS move. Like basically, um, this, if you look in the code, this is labeled as black magic fuckery. Um, <laughs> I can go through these steps, but it's really convoluted. But essentially, um, if you want to have a malicious process that survives pivoting the root file system out from under you, there's a whole lot of really weird stuff involving containers and chroots and namespaces and weird stuff to do to so that your malicious process sees the real root file system as opposed to seeing the init root file system which has nothing in it. Um, funny story, like even though you can never have two root file systems in Linux, if you don't do this you have two root file systems in that process and uh, the, the real one and the init one and, you, and nothing is there, it's like really messed up. So anyway, let's go through how this is, how, how this works in practice. So, 
our little uh, our little devil emoji here. I like emojis. Uh, is our malicious demon? This is this is effectively stage one. Um, we in the the init script in the RamFS forks and execs that. We open the uh, EFI vars. We actually mount the EFI vars file system uh, and mount proc and all that. And then we fetch it out of the uh, we fetch stage two and three out of EFI out of UEFI land. And then we just kind of stay there and we cross that boundary between init RamFS land and you know the real system land. And that execs you know our friend systemd, which then spawns all kinds of other garbage. And when it spawns the policy load, which we detect through FA notify, we give a stop signal to sysctl, right? Sysctl is going to apply the policy that says you cannot ptrace. And there's our EDR over there. I think you can figure out the next step. Uh, we're going to ptrace the, uh, the EDR and then like have our way with it. <laughs> So uh, what ptrace allows us to do is basically we stop the process. You can see uh, we probably end up stopping it right after or before a, a syscall, and we can just back up. Uh, we can just back up to the syscall. We can control the IP. And we back it to the syscall, and then we can just set EAX and set what syscalls we'd like to make. So we're effectively coercing syscalls into the process. So we can call memfd create. Then in our other process, because we can access proc fd, proc pid fd, we can shove stage, stage three in there, which is embedded in stage two, which, by the way, it never touched disk. And <laughs> then we can do an mmap. Uh, fortunately, unlike in, in Windows, uh, mmapping rewrite write execute pages is like totally normal. Libc does it all the time. Um, and then we can just put our shellcode in there. And then we set, oops, I went too fast. Then we set our EIP to the sled there and we actually just jump over. And then we effectively return to, we return to DL open as, um, a, a, as was, as we learned yesterday and as I kind of already knew, like, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the speaker's name. <laughs> we talked about it yesterday. It's on my no card. It's on my no card. Oh no, I'm out of sync. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, Libc has an internal DL open. We can do uh, the old school uh, LD preload trick, except for without LD preloading, we can call the internal DL open. Then we can and have our malicious SO, and that malicious SO can clobber whatever we need to clobber, and then we return. All right. So now we can send the continue to our uh, policy load and load the actual policy that prevents us from doing this. And our EDR is actually now looking the other way. So basically um, if you look in the code and you see our payload, um, and this is sort of a, a point that also Topher touched on, that uh, you don't want to, do, there's two options here about clobbering the EDR, either the input stage or the output stage, and the input stage is complicated. You have to understand how it processes information from the kernel. The output stage is super simple. You, you've already looked at the logs. You know what they say. You just want to, you know, compromise its ability to write things to the output log or things you don't want to the output log. And then there's our malicious process and everybody's happy. The EDR is looking away and we can plunder away. So uh, let's do a little demo. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to uh, tune up Audit D. Audit D is our example EDR. Uh, you know, I know that like Audit D is not a commercial EDR vendor, and you're wondering, does this work on commercial EDR vendor? Yeah, probably. Uh, and uh, we'll install our implant. We'll reboot. We'll set the marker. We'll done do the exploit again, and we'll show that we're invisible. All right, let's do the demo. Okay. Uh, oh God. How do you do this? Windows is hard. Oh God. It's down there. Do it. Okay. Oh God. What no. did I do? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know how to use Windows. <laughs> <laughs> this Windows shit is complicated. All right. Here we go. <laughs> We got the analyst on the uh, on the right. We got the hacker on the left. And um, 
what we're going to do is the analyst is going to turn on the audit rules. He's going to tune up audit so that it just uh, has every exec. Then we're going to tail the audit log. We're going to exploit the enterprise tool. You can see we're root. We're making all this noise. It's terrible. You know they're going to they're going to roll this up. You can see it on the right. All that noise. Then we're going to run our infector binary. Our infector binary is going to make a whole lot of noise. But um, this noise is actually really normal because uh, systems generate uh, init ram fs's all the time, so it's fine. So it's going to make basically all the noise that it makes on a uh, on a UEFI or on a init ram fs update. Uh, this is kind of a lot of reused harness from my horse pill talk from a few years ago. But you know, it's as true today as it was there. And like you know, everything's infected. Have a nice day. <laughs> And then we're going to reboot. Do 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 do. Let's do some cooking show time. Let's see. Let's see if I edited this video well enough. Oh, here we are. We're waiting. Okay, waiting. I'll I'll edit it tighter next time. Okay, and again, we've tuned up audit, and you can see we we're um, displaying the audit uh, log there. Let's let's see. Make a little space there. Do do do. Okay. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to ex we're or actually we're going to set our marker first and that's going to make a little bit of noise. But once you set the timer slack, that's what that PRCTL call is, you can see uh, the marker is set and you can also see that there's no noise in the audit log. We're and then I, I game root again and you can see again no noise. <laughs> we're, we're invisible. We can, we can do all those nasty things we did before. Invisible. It's awesome. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we, can show the, we can show the policy is applied. You can see like YAML mode 3 means ptrace is, dis is completely disabled in the system, and that is true. Like ptrace is now completely disabled in the system, but we inhibited the policy load that prevented us from doing that. And then, uh, like I said, everything's a, fi a file system, or everything's a file in Linux. Like there's an EFI verse file system. If you look, like uh, somewhere in there, there should be a lol key. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, right around there. Because <laughs> hacking is funny. And then, ta da, we did it. How do we get back to the slides? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, Everyone on a Saturday morning at DEF CON is always thinking to themselves, what, what does this all mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just want to bring happiness to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to sleep well tonight. This is the net happiness increase. You're happy. The analyst is happy. That, that payload that you spent months working on is still your payload and not their sample. Everything is good. That's what we're all about, bringing happiness to the world. <laughs> All right. I don't really care about mitigation, so I'm gonna have Topher talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't really care either, but we felt it necessary. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do to mitigate this. Like the one biggest thing is because we're utilizing UEFI variables, is to actually monitor and audit those against your organization's fleet. That would uh, that would be like the first step to sort of mitigating these risks that we've presented. Um, furthermore, EDR vendors, if any of you are out there, you should be detecting UEFI APIs and this functionality in Windows and in Linux spaces if you happen to be doing like Linux EDR. Um, it's not really common for applications to set and get firmware variables. Um, and furthermore, like after the installation of a platform, uh, NV, BS, and RT variables being set is, is pretty weird. Uh, I've never actually seen that in practice. If you have seen that in practice, come talk to me about it because I'd like to know where because I want to abuse it. Um, furthermore, as we kind of showcased, EDR tamper resistance is not at all effective. Uh, it's very easy to like sinkhole uh, the sensor, kill the sensor. As Mike showed, it's very easy to p-trace the sensor. Um, so vendors really just need to work on securing their uh, agents and their processes a little bit better. Um, furthermore, uh, Mike kind of said this in his horse pill talk at Black Hat a few years ago, but assembling RAM disks on systems is just silly. Stop doing that if you're a Linux distro. Um, so like as far as closing the rest goes, uh, we have some future work. So you know the system firmware is a, a, great, a great place to, to hide and there's all kinds of goodies in there and we are just touching the surface of it. And it's interesting like as we were doing this research, 
a lot of companies started announcing that they're going to start looking at the firmware space as a place to hunt. But you know, this is a cat and mouse game, and uh, as far as I can tell, the uh, are we the mouse or are we the cat? Anyway, one of us on is already ahead. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it's us. I'm not sure if we're the cat or the mouse. <laughs> All right. So, like in closing, we're bringing net happiness to everybody. We're gonna have ourselves a UEFI dot party. We're plundering away our loot. We're sucker punching that pesky EDR. Um, and all of our code is located on this GitHub link, uh, Perturb Platypus, or you know, as we like to call ourselves, APTPP. <laughs> uh, we, we just pushed the code, we just confirmed it, we had a, we had a, a timer uh, on a box that pushed it exactly 10.45, uh, it's live, so go, go have at it, plunder away, uh, here's some references that you can look at, uh, that, that's all we got for you.